How, how worried are you about black voters showing up for President Biden in November? Well, I'm not worried. I'm very concerned. And I have sat down with President Biden. I don't rem know. I saw those reports. I've also seen at least one report indicating that I have sat down uh, with President Biden, and I did uh, with him. Uh, and I've uh, told him what my concerns are. I have no problem with the Biden administration and what it has done. My problem is that we have not been able to break through uh, that MAGA wall in order to get to people exactly what this president has done. <laughs> oh, it, it did show, didn't it? Yes, it did. <laughs> Welcome to the show, my friends. It is Tuesday, January 9th. Do you know where your country is? We have to have the smoothest intro, I think, in the whole conservative movement. Let me introduce the Godfather of Conservative. Well, my name is Wayne Dupree. I'm the host of this ragtag fleet, this awesome patriotic conservative bunch of men that have come together um, to explain to you what is going on from three different uh, perspectives. Uh, we might not be right all the time, but God darn, we are not wrong 90% of the time, 95% of the time, we're not wrong. We've been ahead of a whole lot of stuff. Let me introduce the godfather of conservative radio, Mr. Hutch Bailey Jr. Hello, Wayne and Jason, and you're right. We have a quite an impeccable track record uh, in events going on in our world. Uh, not experts, but our filters are the best that there are. Let's put it that way. And let me also introduce Mr. J.R. Robinson from Hutch. Muslim Soul. Yeah. Hutch, Wayne, audience, happy Tuesday. Welcome to the madness. I got to say, after yesterday's show... We were just talking before the show, like 12 different stories dropped. And there is just so much coming at the audience, at the American people. Folks, we're here to filter through the noise, not get you distracted with all the nonsense, and bring you the things that are really important that are really going to impact your life. And so we ask that you take a second to like, comment, share, uh, especially share with people you might not politically agree with, because exactly. we've got to wake people up, folks. Before um, before we get started, well, as we are getting started, we have a couple guests today for you. One of them is our favorite coach, uh, Coach Tommy. Well, Coach Tommy Tullibrand. Well, you know he's coach in our in our eyes. He's coach. He's coach. He's senator, but he's coach. So, Coach Tommy Tullibrand is going to be joining us in just a few seconds. And then we have Natalie, Natalie Winters from the War Room. Hopefully, Steve Bannon will bring himself over here after that but we appreciate natalie um joining us here um and then after that we're gonna dive into some of the stuff that because it's, it's a great we got tunnels in new york um, kosher tunnels kosher <laughs> tunnels <laughs> oh my god and the, kosher tunnels I, I we don't even know what they had down there you know you can imagine, though, the young guys, you, you know, something's going on down there. <laughs> Those guys were way too worried about Everybody has a tunnel under their church, man. Everybody has that. <laughs> they don't well, have they the like, tinfoil hat stuff till later. It's like, it's like, is that the new underground railroad? Like <laughs> <laughs> my friends, let me introduce my favorite coach, uh, and you know what? I, I didn't even realize. I should have realized because Miami used to be my well, they still are. I don't know. I don't know why. You know, they're hard. They're hard. 
But um, he used to be coach, um, defensive coach of the uh, Miami Hurricanes. Uh, coach Tommy Tuberville, also a U.S. Senator. What's up, Coach? What's going on? What's going on? I do have a tunnel underneath my house. <laughs> <laughs> you probably need it though. <laughs> yeah, exactly right, Hutch. Hey, it's called everybody, a bomb shelter. everybody needs an escape route in this day and time. Yeah, it's hey. like, wait a minute. Is the media out there? <laughs> Plan B. Let's go. Um, coach, great game last night. Uh before we get into politics. Great game last night. Uh Michigan is back on top after what 20 some years. Um uh yeah, I, I mean, I remember when they were big time, and now they're back. I guess they're back for a year, but um, they looked good last night. What do you think? They did. I, you know, I, after watching the Alabama game, and then uh, watching Washington play, Washington had to win throwing the ball. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not as physical as Michigan. It was that was a Bo Schembechler game, uh, right? And I told I told people that I watched the D line at at Washington wasn't near as big or as physical as what Alabama was. And they ran the ball on Alabama. I'm thinking there's no way Washington can stop them. The quarterback's going to have to have a great night, and they're going to have to catch every pass to stay in the game. They actually had a chance in the third quarter. They just kept dropping passes. But I, uh, right. Michigan Michigan reminded me of an old Miami team, just line up and whip somebody's butt. Yep. And, uh, yep. They did, uh, they ran the ball first, and then they got the play action going. Quarterback, I thought, had a good game. Uh, but it was uh, it was old football. That's I really like that kind of football. I don't like this chuck and duck. Uh, where you throw the ball five yards and count that as a running play. I don't like that much. Yeah, me neither. Listen, um, real, uh, uh, and I know that you are one busy senator, uh, senior senator from Alabama. Is that right? Yeah, okay. as, of, as of last year. Yeah. I Whatever like that, that means. Somebody please tell me what that means. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, um, there's a there's a there's a lot going on. Uh there's there's a lot of people online um in their communities. Uh you probably see some in the caucus, whatnot. Americans are real angry right now at the spending that is coming through through Congress. Um and I, I know that you're in the Senate. And the house has the appropriations, but it's like uh, it's like they can't turn off that tap. They can't turn it off, and Americans are getting tired of it. Um, uh, you know, just I mean, they're throwing around a trillion dollars like it's a buck fifty. Um, is there? I mean, and 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 what the quote now is either shut down the border or shut down the government. Where do you stand on it? Well, Wayne, you're right, uh, and I talked to some people that has been around here for a while. And there's a few of those back in uh, early 2000s, they discussed and and just thrown back and forth a discussion on just passing eight billion dollars at one time. You know, eight billion dollars. I mean, now, as you just said, uh, Wayne, a, a hundred billion dollars is just, hey, just go ahead and give it to them. Uh, taxpayers won't miss it. I mean, right. it's out of control. Our country's in trouble. Uh, you know, we were 33 trillion in debt. September the 18th of this past year, three months later, uh, I think December the 28th, we were another trillion dollars in debt. That's how much, that's how fast now we're going down the well. I mean, we're, we're, we're sliding down the cliff very fast and nobody wants to cut anything. So our house, new house speaker comes up the other day and I don't know the ins and outs of what the house does, but they come up with the top line for this year of the, how much we were going to spend. It was $1.7 trillion dollars. And so oh, we're, we're cutting. We cut six billion out of one point seven trillion. Ooh. Yeah. And <laughs> as I'm, on, you know, I'm, I'm not a politician I, and I'm up here trying to help the people of Alabama and the p people of this country through education and and all the things that go around that people really need to really think about. But we're in trouble. We're in trouble just for the simple fact that we got people that that think that this is play money and. Yep. Our kids are, I used to say our kids and grandkids are going to suffer. We're going to suffer. Uh, mm -hmm. We're getting ready to suffer. We, my first two years here, we spent, I think, $6 trillion more we, that, that we didn't need, that we didn't, we didn't have to spend it. We, we, you know, we're coming out of COVID, but Biden comes in. He said, man, I, hey, I'm fired up. Let's, let's just spend this money. And by God, we passed more money 
we passed an infrastructure bill that was one point two trillion dollars. We had some that. ten Republicans yep. that voted for it. And by yep. the way, half of that money, you know where it went? Climate change overseas yeah. that we give to other countries so they wouldn't build these power plants that were giving out carbon. These climate cons are running us in the ground. It is a hoax, folks. We do not have a climate problem. What we have is an intelligence problem that's very greedy and they want your money and they want you to spend your money on something we shouldn't have to. So it is, uh, I, I, I get frustrated sometimes to watch what's going on up here, but hopefully we make a change in, in uh, what's going on over in the White House, which we don't know what goes on over there because nobody ever tells us, but uh, uh, hopefully we make a change in 10 months. If we don't, uh, this country won't make it. I, I'm 100% uh, uh, believe that. I agree with you, uh, Coach. And, and, and I'll tell you, one of the things we like to do on this show, um, they use the language as a weapon. When they introduce this term trillion, nobody really, a, a lot of people can't get their arms around that. You say 33 trillion, that's 33,000 billion. You know, I mean, you just can't, there's no way that you can wrap your arms around. That's too much money, too much, too high of a number. But I wanted to, that, that's just a comment. I wanted to ask you about something. I'm a 35 year army veteran. And when I got back from Iraq, I started using the VA system, the VA healthcare system. Uh, not because I didn't have insurance. I have insurance. It gets applied to my services at the VA. I have a really big VA in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, I like the running game too, by the way. Uh, but <laughs> I wonder, you know, I, I, I called in, in, in all fairness, the VA saved my life twice, right? And I have to get procedures there every now and then. And it seemed like the last time I called, which was last week, uh, it seemed like they were reluctant to see me, you know? And, and it was just a feeling that I got. And, you know, you hear these stories about illegal immigrants inundating the VA healthcare system. What's going on with that, sir? I think you're involved in that fighting. Oh, yeah. I'm on I'm on the VA committee, Hutch. And if you can notice behind me, this is my dad's five bronze stars and a purple heart he received uh, coming out of World War II at age 18, wow. uh, landed at uh, Utah Beach and drove a tank across Europe. Wow. I've been to the VA many times with him when he was still alive. Uh, our VA system uh, is the biggest healthcare system in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. We have 22 million veterans in the United States of America, 22 million after these crazy wars we've been fighting for 20 years. Uh, so uh, as I go to these VAs, uh, the numbers I get as a coach, you know, we can all over the country, we get numbers that we can only see 11 million of these veterans. We can't, we can't treat all 22 million. The lines are getting longer and longer. So what we came up with with this system called community care, where if you live in a rural area like in Alabama and you're 150 miles from the VA, you know, if, if you need to go see a doctor for some reason, you go to this community care. It's only for veterans and it's, it's worked very good, to be honest with you. And we need to get really more away from the VAs and have these community cares for people like you, Hutch. But uh, what I found out here recently is Joe Biden with his infamous wisdom with all these thousands of migrants coming in, we are allowing now from the Biden administration, these illegals to go to these community care centers. And so now, oh, what we set up for the veterans now is being overrun by the by the migrants. And people say, well, we, we can let them, we, 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 we love people and we do, you know, we want to take care of people. We can't take care of three or 400,000 a month. It's impossible. These people Absolutely. I don't know what they've got in mind for this country, but it's not good. And uh, I hate what's happened to you, Wayne. I mean, Hutch, that you can't get into a VA. You should be able to go without a, an appointment and see anybody that you want to see. I'm for giving everybody a health card and go to any hospital you want to that is served for this country. It's embarrassing of how we treat our veterans. You know, Coach Tuberville, I got to say you, as you Look in Washington, and some of this stuff just has to blow you away. Like, you have to introduce a bill that says don't use VA resources on illegal immigrants. Uh, it, it, it's just completely got to be befuddling. But I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the latest attacks on President Trump. I know you're a huge Trump supporter. You were one of the first people to endorse him uh, from the Senate perspective. And now they're trying to take him off the ballot so you can't even vote for him. What, what are your thoughts on that? He's right down the street from me as we speak. 
uh, in district court here in Washington, D.C. this morning, uh, fighting these crazy allegations about January the 6th. And first of all, if you're going to be tried for something, you got to be convicted first. You know, if, you, if, if you're going to have something taken away from him, he has no convictions. I mean, it's just the left. They, they cannot afford him to win because he knows he is totally opposite of what their agenda, this Marxist fascist agenda stands for. And so they can't have him. What, dis what disturbs me is we have 49 Republican senators up here. Only 18 have endorsed him. Wait a minute. Right. He's the only one got a chance to win. I mean, you can tell me Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis uh, have a chance. They have zero chance. I mean, he's going to be our guy and get on board or get off, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, I talk to President Trump all the time. I mean, he, he looks good. He looks like he's lost weight. He's works out. He's cut his hair a little bit. He, he, I mean, he, I told him the other day, I had dinner with him. I said, Man, you look the best I've ever seen. He said, I am fired up to save our country. And it's going to take him to do it. And I uh, hope the people in the next 10 months get on board, even Democrats. I mean, uh, I'm a little worried about the, the voting, as we all know. Uh, uh, he won last time. Uh, the stuff that I've seen is embarrassing of what some of these four or five states just shut this counting down, sent everybody home, and then started stuffing the ballots. I mean, it's it's embarrassing. But the media gets after you and say you're a you're a uh, election denier, campaign denier, or election That's denier. Right. I mean, I, they, they call me everything. I don't care. I've been there called everything being a coach. So they can't they can't come up with any new words. Right. Let me ask you, um, uh, you your father, your father and um, your father spent time in the military. Thank you. I mean, uh, great, great service. Um, Hutch, vet, I'm a vet. Uh, we saw this thing with Lloyd Austin, uh, Secretary of Defense, I think. He, you know, he might have some other names that I don't want to say right now. That's why I said that. But, um, Coach, how do you get into an intensive care and not, nobody, nobody in government knows. And all these things that happen overseas, all these decisions that have to be made overseas, and the Secretary of Defense is quietly in intensive care for some elective procedure. So, what was it, plastic surgery? I don't know. But uh, Well, uh, first of all, as, as y'all, hopefully y'all know this, in our lifetime, this is the most dangerous time in terms of world affairs. I mean, uh -huh. We have got ourselves in a bind and we're being punched around, kicked around all over our military bases around the world. And Joe Biden just turns the other cheek. Uh, what, people don't respect us anymore. OK, since Afghanistan, Joe Biden's either compromised or stupid. OK, one or the other. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Secretary Austin, everybody asks, what do you think they should do? As first of all, uh, you make Joe Biden is a head coach. OK. One of his, his offensive coordinator is Secretary of Defense. Nobody makes that decision but the President of the United States. Where is he? He come out and says, I mean, I'm not going to run him off. Uh, right. uh, but Joe Biden's out to lunch, guys. Uh, and <laughs> to, to me, this is a slap in the face of uh, if one of my assistants come out and he did something behind my back and said, uh, you know, it's basically saying, well, he doesn't know what's going on anyway, so there's no reason to tell him. Uh, I don't know whether they call uh, uh, former President Obama or somebody else, but you got to think about this. Secretary of Defense has been to my office several times. He travels with an entourage. Okay, right. you think you think the the president travels with an entourage? Well, these people travel first class. They got military people around them. All these stars and badges as and, aides. I mean, it's unbelievable. And all these aides, somebody make a call. Hey, do y'all not realize that we're on the verge of a world war? The guy's going in an ICU. Somebody please call the White House and say, hey, by the way, the guy that makes the decisions, you know, for our military is under sedation. Right. And so you might need to make another uh, 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 avenue of thought of how we're going to make decisions if something happens in the next three or four days. It's scary. It really is what's going on in the White House. And things did happen uh, in Iraq yeah. in, uh, on Thursday. I mean, you got to wonder yeah. who's pushing the buttons. Oh, yeah. Uh, but that is, I'd like to change it up a little bit, if I might. Uh, some of your colleagues in the Senate, your GOP colleagues, have tried to get a, a meeting with Senator Barrasso 
on securing the border. Can you give us a barometer of what's going on in the Senate concerning the border invasion, really? I mean, this is degrading our yeah. country like every day. It's, it's, it's unbelievable that nothing's happening. Yeah, well, they're saying that we've got eight to 10 million that's come across, uh, which by the way is illegal. Uh, but you can double, you can probably put four or five million of those that don't want to be seen coming across that are in our country. So we've been, we've been overrun. Uh, it's not going to stop. You know, we could sign a treaty today. And I'm thinking about this. Why, why are they holding the American taxpayer hostage? Okay, we'll, we'll do something at the border. We'll cut it from 10,000 to 5,000 a day, which is basically what they're saying. If you'll give us a hundred billion dollars to give to Ukraine, Hey, that's, that, that's extortion. That's what they're saying. They're not saying, okay, we know it's important. We do something at the border, uh, but we also need to help Ukraine beat Russia. I mean, that would be a better way to put it, but this is extortion by the Democrats. They are holding the American people, not senators, not house members. They're holding you hostage for a hundred billion dollars. Uh, but okay, we'll, we'll cut it down from 10 to 5,000 a day. What the heck's that going to do? I mean, right. Uh, shut the damn border down. I mean, it is dangerous. We live in a dangerous world. They live in the twilight zone. I'm telling you. Uh, I go to some of these Democratic senators going, really to God, you don't believe these biological men should play against women in sports. Uh, don't you have a daughter or a granddaughter? What the hell are you thinking? Right. They have no uh, answer. They have no, then they have no answer to this about the board. They fall in line like ducks walking down a road. And it, if one of them stops, they run over each other because they <laughs> follow the party line because they want to get reelected. That's the only way they can get reelected is follow the party line. You know, it's funny when you talk about follow party <laughs> line, because one of the things we talk about is we need some sane people on the Democrat side that are actually not going to just spout the party line you see a little bit of it with Dean Phillips trying to run for president on the House. But I got to say, in the Senate, John Fetterman <laughs> has actually come out and had a couple <laughs> reasonable positions when it comes to the border or Israel. Does that just blow you away? Did they replace him with a body double after his stroke? Or, uh, uh, I think he, I think he got well. He, Is there any he, hope he, there? <laughs> I tell you, I've got to know John pretty well. When we first got here, he was sick. He was pretty right. sick. Uh, he didn't know, you know, he just, he had a stroke. I mean, then he continued to run and he, and he won. Uh, he actually took my, I moved to a different office and he took my old office and I've, I've talked to him quite a bit and, uh, he's different, but I'll tell you, you know, he doesn't, he does not follow the party line. And right. I can, and I'll tell you right now, they don't like it. Uh, but he could care less and Hey, that's what we need. Because there's things that Republicans and Democrats should agree on, uh, such as the border, uh, such as protecting people across this country with crime and 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 going back to what we talked about earlier, the, the money being spent. There's no reason we don't agree to this because it is the right thing to do. Right. But again, it's all about politics. But I don't call it, guys, Republicans and Democrats anymore. I've been here three years. It's, it's Americans versus anti-Americans. That's what go. it is. They want to train, change this country and transition to something different that it's not been. Uh, get away from our Constitution. They break the Constitution every day. And uh, they're not standing up for the American people. They're breaking the law. A lot mm -hmm. of these people ought to go to jail for some of the things that they've done and said and believe in. Uh, but they're socialists. And uh, we're going to fight it. And at the end of the day, President Trump's going to win. And he's going to kick them right in the mouth uh, <laughs> as soon as he gets in. He's going to put people in jail. He's going to go after them. He's going to clean out the 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 trough of the FBI and the CIA. Uh, he doesn't have to run again, so he doesn't have to care. You know, uh, I've talked to him about it, and he's going to do something at that border. I think people are going to like, but uh, we're going to, have to put up with it another year. They're going to work a deal out. Okay, they're going to give 100 billion of taxpayer money, and they're going to work some kind of deal. Hey, they didn't go by the laws uh, that we already had. Why are they going to go for any more laws? I mean, exactly. Exactly. First armored division. Well, Coach, I got to let you go because, again, I know that you were a busy man, but we will have you back on. Uh, you, you you are you are now a member of the show. So we, um, we appreciate you taking time out from your busy schedule. Um, your website is Tupperville.Senate.gov. Is that where you want people to, to go? Yeah. Is that OK? Yeah, All that'd right. be great. And, you know, we're on social media and 
and uh, you know all these fancy things that these kids do nowadays. I guess we all do. But yeah, hey, it's good to be on with you guys. You know, y'all y'all speak the truth and got Thank some you. common sense, and that doesn't go very far up here now. Common sense is few and far between. So God bless you, and hey, it's a new year, and yep. and I will tell you this, and your listeners, this is going to be a very tumultuous, whatever you call it, year coming up. There's going to be uh, things that probably go on that we don't want to happen. Uh, you know, I'm worried to death we have some kind of false flag deal with somebody in here uh, because the Democrats will do anything possible yep. not to, number one, try to keep Trump off the off the ballot, and number two, keep him from winning if he does get on the ballot. So grab a hold and hold on because it's going to be a bumpy ride. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Coach. For all you're doing. Ladies and gentlemen, that was our our – our, our voice in the Senate, Coach Tommy Tuberville, here on the Wayne Dupree show. Glad, um, you know, I, I mean, for, for him to take time out of his busy schedule to join us is a great thing. And um, he said he said a whole lot. He said a whole lot. Straightforward, too. No no garbage, man. I yeah. love that. I like, too, and he's the, like a simple dude where he's yeah. like, like the bill he introduced is, don't spend VA resources on illegal immigrants. Like that was the name of the bill. <laughs> and, yeah, see. And and how do you have to even like have that as a law? Veterans yeah. are underserved across the nation. And yeah, illegal immigrants don't get that. How many time. senators you know can say D line? <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so uh while 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 we wait for our next guest, uh you you heard the Lloyd Austin, no, not the Lloyd Austin. You heard the um, James Clyburn thing. Y'all were talking about yesterday, uh, briefly talked about yesterday, uh, about um, how the Democrats seem to be worried or concerned about the black vote. Well, here's the thing. They, uh, again, the polls came out. The Latino youth vote is swinging more toward the right. Uh, the, uh, you have, you have, um, a lot of black voters that have decided that uh, they aren't going to either they're not going to vote for the Democrat Party or the next or uh, the next or they're not going to vote for anybody now other than Donald Trump. Well, you know, we'll see. We'll see that goes. They're not going to vote for Republicans. I tell you that one thing I wanted to say or one thing I want to ask you is when you see stuff like that. Republicans are going to come and say that their methods worked and they got, you know, they got the black vote and Latino vote to switch over when that, when that's not the case, especially when they ain't got the money. Uh, Hutch, it's, it's a whole lot of that narrative. Uh, you know, they, they get on TV and they put out on, put out on these uh, legacy network things that uh, they put that narrative out there and start getting people to believe it that you know that uh, that's really the, what happened. the thing that you got to understand it, people need to understand and Clyburn is the apex of this whole thing yes uh, I, I'm just re, I'm just finding some things out in the last week that I didn't know that I'm that I'm exploring deeper but it's apparent that Clyburn introduced Joe Biden to the apparatus that got him elected in 2020, right. which was, and I hate to say this, it sucks, but it's the AME network in certain cities, in my city. The church. The church. Yes, the church. Yep. I didn't know that the AME church had precinct captains. They have all the political offices within them, and they mobilize. It starts in South Carolina, and they mobilize, and they branch out to Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Wayne, Michigan, all over the, all the swing states have this apparatus and it doesn't matter what voters do, man. It matters what vote counters do. Right. Well, and that's what I'm afraid of. That's what I'm afraid of. Yeah. And I was going to say in those communities, if you look at that, that organization, we've talked a lot about the ground game and the Democrats are beating Republicans at that. Clyburn is kind of the head of that beast and his, yes, and, he is. and Joe Biden's candidacy was dead in 2016 or 2020. And yep. then Clyburn came out. Clyburn hit the switch, punk, and then and then he boom, went boom, for boom. it. But I, I think the Democrats are running into a problem because 
they keep promising to do things in these African-American communities or these inner city communities. And now they're running out of money because a lot of that's going to immigrants and, and that sort of thing. So, so I think that's the biggest shift in a lot of these, these folks aren't seeing their life get better. And Trump, if you go on his website, he actually has some inner city initiatives in his, in his operation 47 or whatever it's called project 47 that talks about how to actually give the means of production to some of these inner city areas, make resources available, not give them money, but like help them start their businesses and things like that, which that would lead to a revitalization of the inner city. Well, there's a reason why they, there's a reason why they move their, their um, uh, first primary to South Carolina. Right. You know, I mean, again, for the Clyburn uh, thing and stuff like that. So, Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's like what, a springboard what, for them. You think they would accept uh, Donald Trump to come speak? No. Who? Not Clyburn. The, 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 uh, the same exact church that Biden was in the other day. <clears throat> I don't think that church, but I think somewhere in that community, yes. I don't that's think what he needs to church. do. He, he, he's got to go talk to people. Yeah. And that, because Clyburn, and, you even heard him when he said that he, he's talking to his constituents like they're stupid. Right. We yep. have to tell them what to think. We have to tell right. them what Biden. They see what Biden did. You don't have to yeah. tell them anything. But but that is one thing that uh, that the Democrats or even the people that are trying to keep Donald Trump um, from winning the election, they knew they saw what he did in Detroit. He got out of the vehicle with. Carson, he walked the streets and shook hands. They saw that and they figured, well, guess what? If he does that again, if he has time to do that again, he's probably going to win in a super, super gigantic landslide. So we have to get as much court appearances and cases for him to show. He even told the people, I would be here next week, this week. I would be here next week, but I have to be in court. So, I mean, and and where is he right now? He's in court, you know, when he should be uh, in Iowa. Let me, ask you Let me ask you something, Jay, because um, I was thinking about this, too. While Trump is in the court and stuff like that, it seems like, and, and I know President Trump has decided he wasn't going to go to the debate and he's going to do things his way and whatnot. It looks like to me, or this came over my head, the media is just, okay, fine. If he wants to do that, we're just going to do these other two or these other three. We, I mean, you know, almost like he's not here. We're just going to push this out to our networks, Fox and, and CNN and stuff. They're just highlighting um, uh, uh, Nikki Haley, Ron, uh, Ron Sanctimonious, uh, and um, uh, Vivek. And they're just highlighting them. They're just giving them the town hall. They're giving them all that TV time. And it's like they're just pushing Trump to the side. Well, if you look at if you zoom out and look at the Trump situation, these these lawsuits are accomplishing exactly what the Democrats wanted them to accomplish, which uh, virtually none of them do. They have any chance of getting a conviction. And we broke down all the cases. But the fact is that takes him out. I mean, today, Chip Soy is out in Iowa with Ron DeSantis and and it's getting media coverage. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's in New York. So I I think, you know, mission accomplished for what the left was trying to do. What's sad is that the right didn't unify and say, let's like Tommy Tumberville said, let's support President Trump instead of all this infighting. Let's start like we're wasting so much time and money. So, oh, but we got Natalie on. We got Natalie on. Hi. (laughs) <laughs> co-host of the war room and also founder of shop she so right natalie winners what's up how are you hi thank you so much for having me i'm so excited to be on your show i don't think i i ever have been so no. i'm glad we're changing that today <laughs> exactly exactly change that today and in the future because you okay. are somebody that's in the know um and i'm very very uh very educated in the topics of uh, of different things that's happening to our country. Because as you know, there's some people out there that just talk about one thing, one thing. Only. But 
uh, you not only talk about what's happening over here, you you have a great idea or a, a great um, um, direction about what's how uh, what China is doing also to America. Um, I want to talk about um, shop she so right in just a few seconds, but um, you see what's happening to President Trump right now. Uh, he can't get out and campaign like he wants to. It looks like a concerted effort uh, from the left and the right the higher up that they are. And uh, I mean, honestly, some of us aren't worried about Iowa. Some of us are worried about Iowa, but he should be in Iowa right now. And they got him in a court. What do you think about that? Well, look, it's all interconnected. And, and my background is, of course, in Chinese Communist Party infiltration. And unfortunately, those tactics are not just contained to China. We're seeing them play out here in the United States. But I want to get very specific with that critique, because I think you hear a lot of times, oh, you know, the United States is descending into authoritarian uh, lawfare and chaos and totalitarian control. But there really is the evidence to support that. So with the in the context of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, one of the primary documents that sort of guides their military strategy is something called the Three Warfares Doctrine. And it sort of breaks down into three silos. You have media warfare, psychological warfare, and legal warfare or lawfare. And that's exactly what you're seeing play out against the American people. And of course, Donald Trump, who I would argue is our greatest defender, if you look at the political system, not Republicans versus Democrats, but the uniparty versus everyone else. So I really think you're seeing the American ruling class adopt a lot of these Chinese style tactics to really wage war. Again, in sort of this 21st century way, it's not necessarily kinetic boots on the ground, but it's information warfare, it's subversion, it's infiltration, not invasion. And specifically in the realm of lawfare, I think what they're doing to President Trump is a perfect example of how these tactics are playing out in real time. But even if, I mean, you, you go back and you look at all the COVID mandate stuff, I think vaccine mandates, mask mandates, even the prosecutions of January 6 defendants, the way that they've done them case by case as opposed to one single event so they can inflate this narrative that, oh, you know, America is being... Uh, you know, taken over by, you know, hate crimes and, and far right, you know, domestic terrorists, that really is the lawfare angle. So a lot of my analysis, though, in the war, and we, of course, focus on what's going on here domestically, we are very America first, as you guys are, too. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think there's really, it's fair to make the case that our elites here in the United States haven't just been captured by a lot of the Chinese Communist Party elites. Of course, they have foreign influence operations, but they're sort of a merger. And honestly, I think the Biden regime, and we call it a regime because they're not an administration, but frankly, I think they're envious um, of the Chinese Communist Party, the authoritarian tactics, right, the bandwidth that they have to suppress and repress their people. And I think they're sort of trying to do that um, to us now. I think you're right. And, and it, you can look at their own words. You look at Anita Dunn, you know, she worships Mao Zedong, mm -hmm. you know, but uh, just to add a little credence to your widespread spectrum, uh, uh -huh. something you broke the other day, uh, Burisma, the Ukraine gas giant that paid Hunter Biden millions, just lawyered up. Uh, the company and its founder retained a white shoe law firm, Cravath, according to the Foreign Agent Registration Act database. They're clearly terrified of an impeachment inquiry. Okay. Yeah, this is a this is a crazy story. So I always joke, I'm like the only American who frequents the FARA database, the Foreign <laughs> Agent Registration Act. Island. I'm like the only non-bot who's on that website. Um, but I love it. I'm on it every day because you can find a bunch of stories that the mainstream media ignores. And this is a perfect example of one of them. Uh, so brief summary, Farah, if you're working on behalf of a foreign company, a foreign individual, a foreign country, you have to register. It's housed at the DOJ so people can see that your whether the talking points you're putting out or the work you're doing is on behalf of a foreign agent of foreign interest. Now, there's only about 200 or so active registrations for, for example, China. And we know there are a lot more <laughs> than just 200 people who are working on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party here in the United States. Yeah. For example, Hunter yeah. Biden never registered for anything that he was doing. Um, but in the context of a, of a looming impeachment inquiry, the story is really important. So this top, you know, criminal defense firm um, retroactively registered with FARA. So this was for work that they were doing in 2016. So now eight years down the road, 
they are retroactively registering with FARA for the actions that they conducted on behalf of Burisma, which is, of course, the Ukrainian uh, oil and gas giant that was paying Hunter Biden upwards at $80,000 a month. But what's really interesting, and I think, right, I know. But now you now you know why they hired Kravath, because Hunter Biden wasn't doing If Hunter Biden was their other hire, he wasn't doing anything for them. Um, but what's really important here, and I think the buried lead from the story, besides, of course, it's obvious that they're freaking out about a potential impeachment inquiry, is one, this law firm was doing the same exact type of activities that Hunter Biden was doing. So everyone has always said that Hunter Biden violated FARA. And I think it's a pretty clear case as someone who's broken a lot of stories from Hunter Biden's hard drive. You don't really even need to go that far to see that he obviously violated FARA. Um, but this is sort of, I think, case closed, final nail in the coffin on that front. But what's also really interesting is that contained in the filings, it showed who they were meeting with. Uh, within the then Obama White House. Um, they had meetings with Marie Ivanovich, who was one of the key anti-Trump impeachment witnesses. So all this stuff is interconnected. But what I think the more important part is of this Hunter Biden story, and something that honestly, I think Republicans, especially those in Congress, the investigations that they're doing right now, where they have really missed the messaging mark. And that is that Hunter Biden's business deals didn't occur in a vacuum, right? There are lasting ramifications that we are seeing play out now, not just here in the United States, but on the world stage, whether it's what's going on in Ukraine, whether it's what's going on at our southern border, whether it's what's going on with how this regime confronts or frankly lack thereof, the Chinese Communist Party. And of the four people that they listed who they were meeting with, uh, Burisma, two of them are now working at very high level roles within the Biden regime, particularly <laughs> on desks that have to do with energy, climate change, you know, oh, global geez. trade, all of that. So. It's very interesting, I think, when you look at the the paradigm of Hunter Biden's business deals kind of juxtaposed with how you see the Biden regime versus the Trump administration tackling, whether it be China, uh, Ukraine, all this that happened after. Uh, but there really are some lasting ramifications. And remember, CEFC China Energy, a lot of these Chinese foreign influence groups that Hunter Biden was profiting off of, it was the Trump administration that actually was sanctioning them and carrying out through his DOJ the lawsuits and the criminal indictments um, of entities like CEFC China Energy for corruption, for bribery. So that is, I think, mm. such a powerful juxtaposition that's our taxpayer dollars and Donald Trump's bravery and strength that had to come together to stop Hunter Biden's corrupt business dealings. You know, it's really remarkable. And I got to give a shout out to Natalie G. Winners and her Twitter account, too, <laughs> because we love on this show informing people about facts and you you touched on a good point where you can go on a government website and see who registered as a foreign agent and too many people in this podcasting or conservative space just take stories from fox news or that sort of thing <laughs> and just get online and talk about it and folks like you actually do the homework go on read the source document read the court filing read that and the stuff you That's always find it's What's that? That's something you do. Yeah, we, we, we <laughs> the I do the that's same a, thing. Supreme Court self makes a ruling. Yeah. Yeah. Supreme <laughs> Court makes a ruling. I go read the ruling. I don't need to read it <laughs> in that sense. But uh, but I, I love how you do that and how the stuff you yeah. break two, three weeks later, all of a sudden it's front page news. And so so that's a huge shout out. But but with that, I gotta talk about the she's so right product. <laughs> What's the inspiration? That new shirt, but daddy, I miss mean tweets is blowing up the internet. I mean, talk to me about that. Yes, the uh, the left wing has already lost their mind over that shirt in particular. Um, but I, I'm from Los Angeles, believe it or not, and I'm, I'm 22. So I've always been very fashion minded and of course, also conservative. I also think for myself and into the kind of alternative health and wellness culture. You know, I, I hate seed oils. They say fitness makes you a, a far right extremist. Well, then I right. guess I am. And I just got really tired. And I know everyone always says this, but I'm having to buy stuff that was made in China as I was doing radio hits and TV hits, talking about how I want to take down the Chinese Communist Party. And they are our existential threat. And if you buy products that are made in China, you are indirectly propping, rather directly propping up the Chinese Communist Party. So again, like I said, I'm 22. I co-host Steve Bannon's War Room. So when I do something, I do it 110%. And I just decided, you know what? I'm going to change that. I'm going to set out to make a company. We're starting with women's apparel and accessories. You can see the hats behind me. Um, but that is made in the USA. 
Um, but what was really important to me on the kind of business side of things is that I think a lot of times when you do the made in the USA products, you have to pay a ridiculous premium. Right. And I know, mm -hmm. you know, with inflation and under Joe Biden's economy, money's tight for everyone right now. And I think to empower consumers, especially those who are maybe just kind of entering the you know, podcast world are getting exposed to conservative politics, you have to make buying USA made financially feasible for them, right? So the most important thing with the line was keeping our prices on par with other companies that don't do it made in the USA. And I was able to achieve that by really keeping everything in house. Like I said, I'm here in LA, actually later today, I'm going back to the factory to do another run because we've already sold out and basically everything. Um, but the, the other thing that I really, really focused on with, with the designs and you can see there's pink behind me they're very feminine um but i think a lot of political clothing is sometimes very in your face and for women who enjoy being feminine enjoy the pink enjoy the fun but you know you maybe don't want to offend everyone who's also in your pilates class or if you're going to get a <laughs> cup of coffee right i'm all i'm all down to offend people but sometimes you know you got you got to keep it stylish right and I just think that our designs are a little different and that they're sort of nuanced and subtle, um, you know, a little bit conspiratorial, uh, miss M I S S space information, more insecure than the border, stuff like that. So it's not right. super in your face. And the, the last thing on it that I think really sets us apart, you know, we're, we're the side that knows there's a difference between men and women, of course. And yeah. I think for so long we've been putting women, in men's silhouettes for political t-shirts. I'm sure the women listening to this show, you have really cute political t-shirts in your closet that you'd love to wear, but they're on really boxy, bulky cuts that don't show off your figure, or just frankly, that make you look like you're not stylish. And all of our designs, at least for now, I've been getting a lot of hate from the guys. We'll be releasing a guy's collection. <laughs> yeah. um, but all the women's stuff is done on cute t-shirts, tank tops, feminine sweatshirts. So. Nice the style of them is different and caters to women and thank you for letting me talk about this i really appreciate oh, it oh no 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 <laughs> problem um uh we we uh we talk to the new federal state of china every week and um they've been worried about uh xi and um, taiwan the elections are coming up with that too um they're worried that um with the balloons that have been flying over taiwan as of late he could be looking to do something uh, really soon. And yeah, really soon. What do you have on that? Um, are you up to snuff on that yet? Yeah, so it's very interesting. There was some military documentation or just chatter that kind of reached the United States that the Chinese Communist Party was looking post 2020 to open basically four fronts of warfare against the United States ahead of a potential Taiwanese invasion, which would obviously be horrible for the United States, not just from a supply chain security standpoint. I'm obviously a hardcore America firster and don't ever think that we should spill American blood or treasure to defend the borders of other countries. But strategically and from a geopolitical standpoint, having the Chinese Communist Party roll on Taiwan, even semiconductor industry aside, is not advantageous to anyone. But when we have a regime that is projecting not just weakness and inviting aggression, I think that is a valid statement. But I think in the case of the Biden regime, it is intentional weakness, inviting aggression. And I think if you contextualize what you're seeing potentially play out in Taiwan with br the broader geopolitical stage, I think it is very fair to say that they will probably invade Taiwan in, in the next coming months. I think so. If not, they are obviously already have the foreign influence operations going on in Taiwan. Trust me, I could bore you for hours about that. But I think you have to look at what has happened, not just in Taiwan, but I think it starts with what's going on in Ukraine, right? That's obviously depleting our ammunition and stockpiles. You can see, right, we're giving them and even the, the billions of dollars uh, destroying our economy aside, if that's sort of the first front of the war, I think you can look at what's going on in the Middle East as sort of the second front, right? Again, we haven't explicitly, well, it's sort of gray if we've sent troops, we obviously sent, sent ammo to, to Israel and stuff like that, but that also depletes our stockpiles, right? And then I think, honestly, you could even say that the third front in some ways is the southern border. I think that's yep. a, a fair charge mm -hmm. to make. Um, and when you see not just the staggering numbers of Chinese nationals pouring in through that porous southern border, 
Um, but there was just a story last week that showed the Biden regime through, again, this wasn't supposed to be public. It wasn't like Joe Biden came out and gave a press conference saying, hey, in the spirit of diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're going to change our immigration policies. No, they secretly did it. But luckily, the Daily Caller obtained internal memos from a whistleblower within the agency showing that they revised the regulations and policies specifically for Chinese nationals coming across the southern border. It used to be they would ask them 40 questions. They, they watered it down to just five. Some of the questions that they now omit is, do you have experience in weapons training? Uh, which seems like something you'd want to know about Chinese nationals crossing the border. But they also stopped cross-referencing their phone data with uh, the typical kind of tests that they run for any other migrant that has to do with uh, content from known terrorist organizations, hostile foreign regimes, such as the Chinese Communist Party. So mm -hmm. I think the Biden regime has certainly made it easy for them. And just from a, a general, I think, geopolitical posture, too, when you look at things like de-dollarization happening, right, the United States, and it pains me to say it, but it's not the America that it, that it used to be. And even you can go back to it's not the America it used to be under Trump. Um, when you look at what's going on economically and this de-dollarization push, I think is also really, really, really concerning, not just for the, obviously the United States dollar, but for our, our soft power uh, abroad. And I think more more broadly, and it's also interesting on the de-dollarization front, a lot of the deals that are being conducted um, between China and, for example, uh, Qatar, and this happened not too long after what was going on, after October 7th, what was happening in the Middle East, when obviously Qatar was kind of pressuring the United States to stay out of it. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of the de-dollarization deals that they're striking, so that's like the liquid natural gas, stuff like that. It's actually under the auspices of a Chinese company called Sinopec, um, which actually was part of, I'm sure your viewers are, are well aware of, uh, BHR Partners, which was that $1.5 billion private equity fund that Hunter Biden started, what was it, yeah. less than a week after Joe Biden came back from China with him. And one of the investments that they made was with Sinopec Marketing Company, an offshoot of Sinopec, and it's unclear whether or not Hunter Biden still retains an active uh, investment within that company. So all of this stuff sort of bleeds together. So, you know, I think that's, again, but it's not weakness inviting aggression. It is intentional weakness inviting aggression. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right. And, and you know, they you got to wonder about our intelligence community because they've been broadcasting what they're going to do for years. If you look at the man-made archipelago in the South China Sea, I mean, I, I get nervous uh, when these things start happening because you look in history, historically, what Japan did was they didn't stop once they started. Once they started, they kept on, they, they took all uh, of the region. And I wonder, you know, you, you've got Taiwan, which is a very hard place to land, uh, amphibiously, by the way, according to our generals of World War II anyway. But what does that have to do with this? They, they, they've basically built giant air bases there. And, and, and it's not even their territory. You've got other countries that are at risk too, like Vietnam, the Philippines, everyone else in that area. How, how, how much do you think it would be a, a widespread event as opposed to just going to Taiwan, planting the flag and stopping? Sure. I think it's very clear they're laying the groundwork to do that. And they've been doing so for a while. And honestly, I think they're look at, they look at what's going on in Russia. Again, the intricacies of that conflict aside, um, when they see Russia more or less, you know, winning frankly the fact that we've heard such a triumphant narrative from our global elites here oh ukraine's gonna win ukraine's gonna win right it, china's like are you guys crazy you're depleting your ammunition for a war that you're never ever ever gonna win and you're you know trust the experts experts who are leading this conflict the ann applebaums of the world who think that we should you know just deflate the united states currency to infinity just so we can support ukraine just from the, the stance of optics but i definitely think you are right that there are some broader ramifications that aren't just contained necessarily to, to Taiwan when you talk about this. But I, I would say from from my point of view, the Chinese Communist Party has always opted for infiltration as, infiltration as opposed to invasion. Um, they are obviously big adherents of sort of the Sun Tzu school of thought, um, right? They, they want to avoid kinetic warfare at all opportunity. Um, and they're also really into the like promoting the cultural degeneracy, degeneracy stuff, depressing the birth rates here. You know, all of all of that stuff sort of fits under that infiltration, not invasion, the Sun Tzu mindset. 
of how they want to take over the United States. Um, I, I think the best kind of metaphor that I've always looked to, you know, it's not necessarily that the Chinese Communist Party, although I'm sure they would love it, you know, needs the White House to be flying the Chinese flag. They just want every person who is in that White House to be compromised, right? Yep. Whether that's like a Hunter Biden type situation, whether it's the honey pots, whether it's because they've all gone to colleges that are chock full of cash with the Chinese Communist Party. So they're teaching them basically Maoist propaganda. These people are, are all reliant on their prescription drugs that are made in China, all their clothes are made in China. So I think that's sort of the tactic, right? That like the Chinese Communist Party has empirically taken with the United States. And I think you could even really go a step further and, and say, I don't really think the Chinese Communist Party is like interested in you know ever invading or conquering the United States per se. I think they're more in the business model of turning other countries into tributary states. Um, and I think replacing the United States, not even, I think there's a lot of in the academic community debate about, especially like the political science space, you know, oh, do you want a unipolar world order right, where the United States is the global hegemon? Do you want a multipolar world order where it's maybe split between the United States sphere of influence and the Chinese Communist Party's sphere of influence? And the prevailing academic discourse is that China wants the United States and China to coexist. But as you guys know, you can never have two leaders that never, two, two CEOs don't work well. So I think the Chinese Communist Party more broadly wants to replace the United States as a global hegemon. And I think you see that through the Belt and Road Initiative. You see that through things like um, the, the New Silk Road, where they want to turn all of these other countries, whether it's even countries like Italy, believe it or not, Italy signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but of course, in the developing world, the African countries too, through these sort of predatory loan mechanisms, I don't really think they're interested in, in conquering land masses by traditional mechanisms. What they want to do is just sort of like de facto conquer them, right? You know, it's funny, you, you, you guys do a great breakdown on your show talking about that. We, we like to say it's cheaper to buy a senator than it is an <laughs> aircraft carrier. So yeah. just, buy, just buy a bunch of senators. And they don't want the craziness that they are bringing into this country with the transgender stuff and the social decay and the lack of cohesion and support. They just want our money. So they don't need to send ships over here to take over America or any of that stuff. They just, they just want to take it over culturally. One thing that you've done a lot of work on too, though, is how China is digging in to encourage the social decay in America. And before we get you out of here, can 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 you just give our audience kind of a take on how that's happening? And we've had the NFSC talk about it, but yeah, I think you really do a great breakdown on that. Sure. So I think the again, like prevailing discourse on, say, for example, TikTok is that, you know, oh, they're using the app to spread, you know, pro Beijing propaganda. Yeah. Oh, they're censoring narratives that are saying COVID developed. Uh, in a lab, which we know is true. Uh, shout out to Fauci, who's testifying right now. Um, but I think that the, my take with TikTok, which can then be extrapolated to sort of the other areas, is that it's not, they're not content with just influencing political discourse here in the United States, specifically about China, right? It's not just that they want every American to think, China's great. They're an economic right. success. They're an economic miracle. I think a lot of the uh, foreign influence operations, the foreign lobbying that's done by the Middle Eastern countries, like the Saudi Arabia's of the world, they're more content with the current world order. They just want to be the primary country within the middle. You know what I mean? The, the, within that context, they want to be number one. So it's just like Iran hates the Saudis and they duke it out. But with the Chi with China stuff, it's a different beast, right? They don't want the United States to be the world superpower. They do not like anything that we right. stand for. And like I was saying, they use these subversive tactics uh, to achieve that. So I think when you compare and contrast the TikTok that you have in the United States versus the Chinese equivalent, right? The tick, you go, I don't have TikTok, but you log on to TikTok here in the United States. I've heard from my friends, some of the stuff you see, it is just absolute cultural degeneracy. There's no other way to spin it. Meanwhile, on the Chinese version, I mean, you even use the word pronoun, you even dye your hair blue. <laughs> you're probably you're sent to like a camp, right? You're you're done. You go to Xinjiang, like you're you're done. And I think that right there is like a very telling moment, right? It's a very telling thing. Um, and ByteDance is, of course, the their parent company, and it, the founder of it 
a former founder, he was edged out. I think he thought he was going to get, you know, Jack Maude or, or unpersoned. Um, but in the founding documents of TikTok, he admitted that the company is designed to, quote, promote socialist core values and to spread allegiance to the Chinese Communist Party. And, and people forget that. Um, and I think the way they're doing it isn't just specifically about China. It's about more broadly subverting American culture. And, and I'll say a lot of my work, right, has focused on these Chinese foreign influence groups. They're very funny names, you know, the China United States Exchange Foundation, the Chinese People's Association for Friendship and Foreign Contact. They are very euphemistic sounding and innocuous, but they're not very nice. Um, but a lot of these groups, I think, in the early 2000s and even early 2010s were more focused on just selling the American people on the narrative that China is an ally, at most a competitor, but it's not an enemy. And that the economic miracle of China's growth is something that capitalists should love and support. But none of that stuff is true. And I think that was sort of the gateway drug in getting Americans to be like, oh, the Chinese Communist Party isn't really a threat, right? But when you look more at the broader social social issues, and also my, my last point too, again, this is all just circumstantial evidence, but I think it's very telling. You know, these Hollywood studios aren't allowed to even put Taiwanese flags in the movies that they play right. in China, right? Chinese characters have to be played by Chinese actors, right? They have these companies, you know, yeah. hook, line, and sinker. Like, they control them. They're their proxy states. Whatever they want to do, these right. American companies comply. So if the Chinese Communist Party really did not want these companies spreading their degenerate cultural messages, whether it's, you know, the Super Bowl ads, the Pride Month stuff, they would tell them stop that and don't do it and those companies would listen but they're right. totally okay with it because they like the message that that's promoting here in the states let me tell you something this might be the first time that you have been on this show but it won't be the like <laughs> i promise you i talk a lot i apologize no 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 i mean you know what it's, Thank you. it's different it listen everything uh, we're gonna to have to unpack and and watch this. You got Wayne tongue tied. That doesn't happen very yeah, often. Yeah, right. yeah, I mean, because I mean, look, I even I even sent you a um, I even sent you a DM while you were talking. I was like, "Girl, you good? You good?" <laughs> <laughs> Thank mean, you. I mean, and 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 the thing is, you say you're 22. I am 22. Yes. Uh, wild. <laughs> No, no. I got to tell you something before you leave. You mentioned something about the Chinese Communist Party planting the flag, right? I'm from yeah. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. And I went to the city county building about six months ago with my son, who's on the fire department. Uh, he got promoted. But there's about 10 flags in the hallway. And one of them was red and gold. And I thought, man, they got the Marine Corps flag in here. And I went over and I pulled it open. It was the Chinese Communist Party flag. In Allegheny yep. County City County building. Just I bet they're it. a sister city. I'll tell you. Oh, yeah. I, I I I had to when you said that I had to mention that before you left. Horrible Very, stuff. I pray for our country. Well, I'll tell you this. Um, Natalie, again, um www.she's so right that CEO is um the company, correct? Uh yeah. your your Twitter is Natalie G Winners. Um she is she is lighting up her her twitter account with same inform with more information that she is given out today so make sure that you follow her on there nally we, i'm gonna pr i am going to hound you to come back on the show i'm uh, happy to come on anytime you, seriously we can you, set up a weekly thing i'm down <laughs> there you go yeah, yeah. There you yeah. Go. Whatever, what you ask for Making deals on air there you go <laughs> 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 no, I mean again, your your um to 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 listen to you break down things. That's what we love to have guests come on and do because it's almost intoxicating. Because there's sometimes like the new um, the new federal state of China does it. You've done it, but you 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 give us stuff that we did not know, and then we're like. Well, I'm sorry. I, I know I'm a real good guest to have on because I make everyone super, super happy. No, super scared. Go. But we have to know this stuff, right? Believe exactly. me, they're paying the mainstream media so they don't talk about it. So I'm happy right. to uh, 
to fill the void, the market niche, and all things. <laughs> well, look, do me a favor and um, give our audience some last thoughts um, before we let you go. And then uh, thank you so much. Thank you for, so much for your time. No, thank you so much for having me. My, my last thoughts for your audience, I'll keep it succinct. Uh, it's going to be a total 180 from what we've been talking about. But whatever you guys are thinking about working on right now, whether it is signing up to become a precinct committeeman, starting your own podcast, can't, volunteering for a campaign, going to knock doors, starting a Twitter account, starting an Instagram meme account, starting something political, just do it now. This is your sign. There's absolutely nothing to lose. If you're scared that people are going to laugh at you or make fun of you 20 years down the road, 30 years down the road from now, you're never going to care about that. And we are at a moment in time right now. I think it's, a, it's fair for us to look back and say socialism doesn't work. Communism doesn't work. I think we are the people who are living through the time period where we want to be able to look back and say globalism didn't work. And if we don't fight, if we don't use our voices, we're not going to have that ability to even look back and tell our grandchildren and great grandchildren that globalism didn't work because we're going to be enslaved in these, you know, 15 minute West style cities and we're not going to have the freedom of speech. So use these precious, precious rights that our ancestors spilled their blood and treasure for uh, preciously and wisely. Uh, and it's worth it. So just do it because it's worth it. <laughs> I love it. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a new sister of the Wayne Dupree show. <laughs> Natalie, Natalie Thank Wayne. you. Thank you so much. And, uh, and Thank you, um, guys. If, if you need anything from us, you let us know. And we'll be talking about that connection. Um, totally. Yes. And Thank likewise. You. Thank, Thank you, guys. You, you have a wonderful so day. Thanks, Bye. Natalie. 22 years old. She, she's not 22. <laughs> she can't be 22 with all that information. She's good, man. She can't be 22 with all that information. You know, good. what she said, the last thing she said, mm -hmm. I was thinking about this the other night, guys. You know, we're all up there a little bit in age. Not, not as much, some not as much as others. But if you look through your own life, you look through your own life and all the different things that have happened and all the people in your life that are your age or younger than you that have been snuffed out, that have been killed or died or got sick or whatever. And you're still here. We got chosen, man. We got yeah. chosen to be here for right now. I should, yeah. I can only speak for myself. I shouldn't be here right now. I'm, I, I should have been it. taken out a couple times already, if not more, yep. you know, and I'm still here and you guys are still here. And if you're still here, there's a reason you're still here. There's a reason. There's a reason. Exactly. There's a reason why we are broadcasting. There's a reason why God put us together. There's a re I mean, there, there's a purpose. There's a purpose. And 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 honestly, you know, I've I've said I've said many times. I, I, uh, I I look at some of my classmates. Some of my classmates are gone, man. Yeah. Some of my classmates are gone. Some of my friends are gone. I'm still here. There's a reason. There's a reason um, that the average age of a, a male's lifespan here on this planet is like 70, 76, 77. I, I mean, that's that's another 20 years for me. I mean, if you go with that, that's another 20 years for me. I can't get back the time that I've spent already. And, and, and nothing's promised on the other side. Nothing's promised tomorrow either. But nothing's really promised on the other side of 76, 77. So what is my purpose? God is like, this is it. This is it right now. And when he gets tired of it or when he's done, I'm gone. I've always thought, I've always thought like that. Whenever my purpose or whenever our purposes are gone, we don't stick around, just stick around. We're out. You know, you know we, we talk about it a lot offline, how, you know, we, we get on here hoping to make a positive impact in the world and help wake people up. That, you know, if we had to say, like, what's our mission statement, give people information, wake people up to what's going on. And Natalie touched on a good thing. And it was something that my pastor at my church has said the last couple sermons. Do something today. Just start and just make it a routine. We get on here four times a week, every time, same day, same channel. And Natalie said it, too, where she was talking about just do something. Whatever it was you were going to do that you're going to do to help save this country. Because we had two different guests from two different total backgrounds. And True. everybody gets how important this year is. How wild it's going to get. All your craziest conspiracy theories you thought. Like this is the year 
where nobody sh- I mean we had Jews popping out of the sub out of the underground tunnels yesterday who had that on the bingo card Fan- <laughs> Fanny it just came out yesterday that turned out she was sleeping having an affair with the law firm that she hired to prosecute President Trump and it came out and gave him like hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it six hundred thousand dollars and then he spent some of that on her taking her on a trip and it came out somebody pulled the dc visitor logs she was in the white house meeting with counsel prior to charging president trump and they've all denied that so i i mean he's the one he was there right and then he got put on a rico case and he's never been on a rico case in his life right yeah, the, I mean, there's so much going on. And that's why folks like Natalie are so important because she doesn't just sit on here and say, oh, I read this Fox News article. Let me tell you what I think. She actually puts in the work to get the information. And, yeah. you know, she's one of those people that we love referencing, at least, you know, when we're looking up our stuff. You know, some, something happened this morning. Y- y'all y'all might have heard it. Um, I was talking to Jay right before. Uh, wait a minute, too. Because he also he also gave me a video. Um, there are you're going to hear headlines about uh, Trump's lawyer um, speaking about uh, how presidents can order C- uh, SEAL Team Six to assassinate rivals. Okay, um, and I I know probably uh, Hutch remembers this a long time ago when we were talking to President Trump. In an interview, what happens is they are asked questions. And when you give an answer, that becomes a story. Almost like the question was never asked. I do remember that. Yeah. Yep. The answer, it the answer is almost like um the person is uh, uh offering that answer to you without even a question being asked. Okay. So when y'all see that. That uh, that the Trump lawyer um, said the president can order SEAL Team Six to assassinate. Let me play. I want you to listen to how it all. So, went in down. your view, could a president sell pardons or sell military secrets? Those are official acts, right? It's an official act to grant a pardon. It's an official act to communicate with a foreign government, and such a president would not be subject to criminal prosecution? Uh, The sale of pardons example is an excellent example because there were allegations about a sale of a pardon, essentially, when it came to President Clinton's uh, pardon of Mark Rich. And the U.S. DOJ carefully considered, for the very reasons we've emphasized in our brief, decided not to prosecute President Clinton with that because it raised concerns about whether or not a president can be prosecuted for his official acts. There's actually an op-ed in the National Review from Andrew McCarthy. But your position is that he can't be prosecuted for that. Yeah, he's yeah. and that was as long as it's an official act. I mean, in certain cases, purely private conduct under Clinton against Jones, he'd be subject to prosecution for that as long as he's not in office. Could, but could as long as it's an official act. Could a president order SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival? That's an official act in order to SEAL Team 6? He, he would have to be and would speedily be, you know, uh, uh, impeached and convicted before the criminal what prosecution. If you weren't, what if you weren't? There would be no criminal prosecution, no criminal liability for that? Chief Justice's opinion in Marbury against Madison and uh, uh, and our constitutional tradition and the plain language of the impeachment judgment clause all clearly presuppose that what the founders were concerned about was not. I asked you a yes no yes or no question. Could a president who ordered SEAL Team Six to assassinate a political rival who was not impeached would he be subject to criminal prosecution? If he were impeached and convicted first, and so, so your answer is. Is, no. is my answer is qualified? Yes, is there's correct. a political process that would have to occur under our, the structure of our constitution, which would require impeachment and conviction by the Senate. In these exceptional cases, as the OLC memo itself points out from the Department of Justice, you'd expect a speedy impeachment and conviction. But what the founders were much more worried about than using criminal prosecution to discipline presidents was what uh, James Madison calls in Federalist Number 47 the, the you know the, the newfangled and artificial treasons. They were much more concerned about the abuse of the criminal process for political purposes to disable the presidency from factions and political opponents. And of course, that's exactly what we see in this case. I've I've asked you a a series of hypotheticals about criminal actions that could be taken by a president and could be considered official acts. And I've asked you, 
would such a president be subject to a criminal prosecution? He told you already. If he's not he's a answer. convicted. Finally- and your answer, uh, your yes or no answer is no. I, I <laughs> there is a yes. I, I mean, look, he said yes. A, or no, right, exactly. And, 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 but uh, whoever slipped that question to her for the purpose of getting an answer like that so that they can put it out in the media, well, you can assassinate. This is just nice. It almost makes him look like, but all it makes Trump's lawyer look like, you know, he's speaking for President Trump in a way, but he was answering the question, is what I'm trying to get to. He was yeah, answering he's James Madison. I mean, well, and, and his lawyer did a nice job breaking it down. And just so, so Wayne said, you're going to see all these things about SEAL Team Six and assassination. The article is going to be crap. The, the the simple, the layman's explanation is the Constitution, the president is exempt from any prosecution of any official act he does to prevent people from being able to chase after the president and sue him and, and the whole country going after him legally. The first step would have to be that there would be impeachment against him. Once the impeachment happened, then all these institutions could go after him. That's if he how he's convicted been. in the Senate. If he's convicted of impeachment, that and that's that was intentionally written that way. Otherwise, you could just sue people. People could just sue the president. Otherwise, you could do what they're doing right now. Right. 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 This is this is the video that um you want to give this a uh, quick context, Jay. Yeah, about- so there there's a bunch of on the ground reporters in New York City that are that that are filming Trump going in and leaving the his hearing today. Just listen to what these police officers oh, yeah. say. You know the worst part is, even if he has his and he's hanging out of it, he'll be on the other side. Of the <laughs> I mean, if he's well, driving, we've got a good shot. Yeah, if he's driving with the front window open, yeah, or if it's a convertible, yeah, yeah. I wasn't thinking about that. Yeah, like if he just pulls up like, like JFK, a Miata, it's like a. JFK, <laughs> Maybe someone just like they told JFK, you know what you should do? You should take a convertible. <laughs> it's so nice out. Ah. These are police officers. No, 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 no. Those are reporters. No, the guys talking were police officers. No, they were reporters. Oh, were they? Yeah. Okay. They had their cameras on the police officers. Right. But it was okay. a hot mic. From the story wow. I read. I mean, I wasn't there, obviously. Right. Yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense because you know the media the, is. The I mean, who I mean, if it was policeman said it, it should should be fired real quick. But um, oh, a, a police officer is not going to say something like that. They're worried about him getting assassinated. That's the right. whole reason they're there. Right, right. I think. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I, I think that was the reporters. Yeah. Could be. I'll Can have you... to double check it. Yeah. All right. But, yeah, the uh, it, it's ridiculous because we've talked about it on the show, and I think I probably, of the three of us, thinks it's more likely that somebody makes an attempt on President Trump's life. I, I probably think it has the, the highest percent, but f- this is getting normalized. People are talking about no, it. No, I think so, too, 100%. For me, I, I wish don't. he quit. Do, I wish he quit doing rallies. Really? Uh, well, at least have have p- enough protection. It's easy to kill somebody, man. I I know, I know, I know. I mean, you know, you can put something in his uh just, in his ice cream, just throw a know? grenade in there, you know, or blow the yeah. freaking place up. And and it and, doesn't. Mean, I mean, it could just be like all these, you know, shooters that are happening in schools. These are just all mentally deranged people. I mean. There was actually somebody that drove from California to the East Coast to take out Kavanaugh when they were doing Roe versus Wade. Like they caught him. He had weapons. And I mean, you'd think this would be front page news, but it was barely covered. The, guy, and, the tranny that they had that, that shot the school up <laughs> the other day was on the FBI's radar. Right. It's well, like, why I do mean, we why do we keep funding these people? That's something that's something that uh, we've talked about on this show many times is that many of these people that many of the people that do get away, well, not get away with that. They might get caught, shot or killed or whatnot, but um, 
that do these mass shootings, they're always on the FBI watch list. They're always on it. And the FBI let What's them go. What's that make I mean, you think? What's that make you think sometimes? If, if, the, if, if the common denominator of all these shooters is an agency, then what's the agency have to do with the things going on? Right. Well, and the bigger thing, too, they, they've they come out and they're spending how much of their resources going after people on – we covered it yesterday. They're going after people who are on the grounds on January 6th. And, like – Outside. Like, yeah, yeah. They, they didn't even go in the Capitol. Didn't they're go. on outside in the rotunda, and you have FBI resources that oh, are – yeah, exactly. They're just sitting there chilling. And you have FBI going resources there? going after them instead of following up <laughs> with all these people that are doing these horrible things. It's like, what are you doing over there? Right. Got no weed, camera. Weed, weed. Yeah. What were you doing? I, I was taking a smoke. I, I, six years. Uh, <coughs> yeah, I mean, okay, so Let's see. There's a little conversation going on in the chat in uh, in Getter. In Getter, yeah. It, it, the thing is, when an organization sets out to kill somebody, they don't care about the assassin. He's he's. They'll give him up. Just look at uh, yeah, Lee yeah. Harvey Oswald. Right. Look at um. Uh, I mean, and it doesn't have to be an assassin. Look at um. Uh, Wall get, uh, gate 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 the gate. That the, I'm I'm the DNC gate, the w- wall gate. <laughs> I don't know where you're going. Are you talking the softball game? No, Nixon, the Nixon thing. Oh, oh water, water gate. gate. Yeah, they go way back. Yeah, that, yeah mean, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Watergate. That's an excellent Watergate. example. You yeah, got the, a guy that thought he was supposed to be promoted to director of the FBI. Nixon yep. passed him over, and Nixon was dispatched. Yep. By them. Yep. Well, and what I'm saying too is you don't even need to to like have the FBI go find somebody or the CIA. Some of these people are so brainwashed. There are people oh, in America that think January 6th was an attempt to overthrow the government. They really do, man. They they, they really believe that. I was saying that well, yesterday on social media. That I mean, there's bloodthirsty people out there want people to die. Well, Nikki, this. I mean, uh, who is it? Um uh What's her name? Um, Nancy Pelosi pushed that. Right. She pushed that. I mean, and, and she pushed that from the speaker chair. Yeah, it's true. unbelievable. She's, she, she ought to be locked up. And, and and look, and guess what? She and caused only, it all. Right. And not, not only did she push it from the speaker chair, you had Republicans like um, 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 uh, S- 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 Stefani that agree with it. Right. Several more people. than just her. That's, that's right. Ted I had Cruz. I, I said her name because some people are, yeah, I, I know I said it yesterday, but I'm still saying it today. Some people are still throwing her out there for vice president. She, no, she's not who you think she is. Well, you you and think, think about is. how this political discourse has moved. You know, 2014, it was you were racist or you were deplorable or you were dumb or bad for America. Now they really believe that the, that the country is being overthrown by the, by the MAGA movement. What would you do if you had the chance to go back in time and stop Hitler? And you think of that, knowing what Hitler would be. That's the reality these people live in every single day. Yeah, I mean, I've been seeing, I've been seeing the Hitler thing on a lot. What is it? I mean, <laughs> it's a, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I I just don't understand. Um, I, I mean, it's like they keep bringing it, bringing it up, bringing it up, bringing it up. You know, they they call. You know, I, I guess I guess people just don't learn stuff these days. I mean, there's no more learning. You know, when you get rid of history, um, historical stuff, and everything, uh, there's an old saying: you learn history or you read things so that you aren't doomed to repeat it. Mm-hmm. That, that's how it's supposed to go, but. For some reason, they want to get rid of history and repeat. Of course, they what do. happened a long time ago. They hate know? our history, man. I mean, they're, they're, the, our yeah. history is is handcuffing them from yep. doing what they want to do. Yeah, 
It's sickening. It really well, is. And there's so many people that just go along. Like I'm Facebook friends with one of my high school English teachers. And every time I post on my personal page, he's a crazy lefty. He like, he will reply. Like I'll share, Oh, here's a clip of the podcast or that kind of thing on my personal page. He'll reply and he'll be like, Oh, Trump's a dictator. Or, or, and, you know, you, and, and you communicate with him. And it's like, he really believes as a grown ass man in his seventies <laughs> That Donald Trump, and this is somebody that taught in high schools for years, he really believes Donald Trump is interchangeable with Hitler. It's just, it's just, just we're crazy. in, you know, and we're the in hardest part, The hardest part to take is they're saying that as they're doing that, right? That's they are absolutely part. personifying these idiots in Nazi Germany, but they're okay doing it because yeah. if you're fighting against Hitler. Anything's on the table like it, you know, and, and that's why like this last election, I was really hesitant of the results because these people believe all this crap. So what would you do if you were 1943, you knew what Hitler would become and you had a chance to count a vote that said Hitler, would you throw it away or would you put it in the count file? Pretty simple. <laughs> it's a shame that we have that many weak minded people in this country, though. Right. You got to blame it on them. You know, you're you're exposed to the same thing I am. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing special about you. You know, you're not. If you watch, if you decide that you're going to turn on the TV and listen to these idiots, it's not even entertaining. The national news, I can't even watch right. it. It's it's, it's not, not even. It's not. They talk about the Golden Globes. Who cares about that? Yeah. You know, so it, it's they have to take some blame for this. You know. Um... We're getting ready to get ready to come up on our um, final thoughts. I want to thank everybody for tuning in to the show. I want to thank um, Senator Tuberville. Yeah, great show. Coach, coach, yeah. coach, coach Tuberville for joining us. Uh, bright, bright, uh, uh, bright reaction of common sense. Uh, and that's, that's what he is. He's a common sense um, senator. And then we had Natalie, who is – uh, a woman beyond her years uh, for, I mean, for a 22 year old to be that into what is going on and to have that amount of information up here. That's a treasure trove. Boy. That, 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 that's, that's a treasure trove. I, I was shocked. I mean, not shocked, but uh, to be that old, to be that interested in these things, these are great. Topics, it's great, right? Exactly. I mean, to be spitting off stuff like and this. to put in the time to really get the facts, not yeah. what anybody said, but I'm going to go read the document so that I know exactly what it said. Like we played that court hearing. There's going to be a thousand stories of fake news today, talking about yeah. Trump's lawyer saying he could send his team yeah. sick to assassinate yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. Is she married? <laughs> she might need some brown sugar the reason why i say it is because she's probably running guys off being that smart <laughs> you know what i'm saying well, look what she does at the end of the day she worries about her figure and fashion i mean that's right. a perfect woman <laughs> yeah 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 that, i mean you know, does okay. all that serious work and then but she knows what time it is she is, I mean, she she's a fireball. Bam. Um, okay, so uh Jay, give me some last thoughts. Hutch, give me some last thoughts, and then uh then I end the show. Hey folks, Taco Tuesday. Make sure you enjoy. Thanks for tuning in and, and hanging out with us, Knuckleheads today. We appreciate it. Take a minute, like, comment, and share. Uh, that helps us get reach. Um, yesterday I recommended everybody watch Fall of Minneapolis. Um, that came out a while ago. Today, I'm going to give you a new one. Uh, Tucker had an interview on him, January 6th, The True Timeline. Uh, I've only seen it on Twitter, um, and that was a Twitter handle, at January 6th, True Timeline. Uh, Tucker interviewed the guy yesterday, and so I went and watched the documentary. It's really pretty fascinating. When What he did was he took all the available video that he could find, and he juxtaposed it all at the same time, which is kind of what I've been trying to do is you – piece together the day he did a really nice job where you can see this was happening here this was happening here this was happening here and it you know it shows people behaving badly but when you watch that and you know share it with people that think it was an insurrection like i've been to rock concerts that were more violent than this and 
it, it's it was pretty eye opening. So so that's my shout out to you guys uh, today. But thanks for tuning in. Over to you, Hutch. Yeah, there's a a video going around with narration that shows three Capitol Police or Metropolitan Police. I'm not exactly sure which uh, department beating the hell out of this lady. I mean, it's unbelievable. You watch them sticking her with batons, spearing her, uh, hitting her 50 times in the head. Unbelievable. People, Americans need to watch that. And I'm a pro-law enforcement guy most of the time. Uh, but this has got to end. Another thing, I want to leave you with a, a granule of wisdom from Senator Tuberville. Uh, if you have any doubt in your mind that there's a uniparty, he laid it pretty much to rest. 49 Republican senators, 18 endorsing President Trump. Think about that. Yep. That's less than half. That's all I got, man. Great show. Um, before we go, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Don't forget, click on the click on the subscribe wherever you are. Um, and also click on the notifications. Turn on your notifications so you know when we go live if you forget. Um, I we know that the uh, you know I kind of briefly talked about the the billion or on the trillion dollars uh, that Congress is talking about doing it well. The leaders are talking about um, uh, agreeing to. You have some Republicans coming out. I'm going to vote against it. I'm going to vote against it. Okay, I thank you for that. The I think, but the only way to stop it is that it's going to need all the Republicans. I think because the Democrats, five. the Democrats are all going to vote for it. So you don't need all the, I mean, you only need, right, five or six of Republicans to vote, and it, and it passes the House. So I, my question to you, or my question to everybody out there is, do you think that the Republicans are strong enough to all join together no. to stop the this spending bill? You can talk about Speaker Johnson all, all you want to, but are y'all smart enough to come together and say no? Hey, man, once you take the money, you took the money. That's how it is. Here's the other funny thing is even some of those people that vote no, they're just doing that because they know it's going to pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. T typical trick. Yep. It's their game. We've seen it before. That's why they have a Tomorrow. Win. Exactly. Tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be back. Wayne Hutch and JR from Muslim Shoulder. Y'all have a great evening. God bless. <laughs>